Ever since the dawn of humankind, we've sought the origins of our life and its purpose. Some have chosen to look to science, religion, or philosophy for answers. Many have turned to the great masters such as Lao Tzu, the Buddha, and Jesus Christ for spiritual illumination. Still others have sought truth through their own direct experience. All of us are searching, knowingly or unknowingly, for enlightenment, truth, and harmony in our lives. This program, hosted by Dr. Gregory Penn, will help you aspire to a more fulfilling and rewarding life. Welcome to Aspire. We're down here on the beach and it's magnificent. As you look at the water and the energy and the waves, you feel a pulse, a pulse of life, the significance of life. We're going to be working on the Tao this morning, one of the most significant of all teachings in it, given to us by the Master Latsul. Let me read to you quickly what he says. My words are easy to grasp, easy to follow, though the world neither grasps nor follows. We're going to talk about our resistance to life and how much of our life is spent in resistance to what is really going on. So stay tuned and be with us. Come Aspire. One of the most interesting things that I found as I began to go beyond my intellectual study of these principles of life and began to take more time for my meditation is that in actuality, ladies and gentlemen, we are in opposition to our own life. We create such resistance in our life. I remember the many years I spent teaching people how to get more and how to have more. Basically because in getting more and having more, I felt I would have more. I lived under that illusion that the more one possessed and the more one had, the happier one would be, the more fulfilled. The word success became very important. Well, we all get the things that we think that we need and that we want. Sometimes that's a very big curse in our life, getting those things, and yet they bring about such lessons. When you finally get everything that it is that you need and that you think you want in your life, one of the most interesting things that occurs is that we begin to see that all of those things that we wanted so badly, that we sweated for, were not the things that we really needed, were not the things that we really wanted. We misinterpreted the whole thing. And in that misinterpretation, we begin to see how we oppose our own life. You and I, we live in direct opposition to life whenever it is more important for us to gain luxuries and objects and things rather than finding ourselves as a spiritual being. Finding ourselves as a spiritual being is a life quest. Not many people go after it. Not many people seek it out. We think we'll find it somewhere in a philosophy, in a theory, in a religion somewhere outside of us. And we miss the whole work this is not a theory, a philosophy, a religion. Your life is very important. And if you think about spending most of your life in opposition to yourself, in opposition to the meaning and the significance of life, then we can see why we suffer so. Our suffering doesn't come because a God that we are told by Christianity, which lives outside of ourselves, creates suffering. Our suffering is caused because we do not learn to harmonize with life. The last thing that we learn in school, in fact, we really never learn it, is how to harmonize with life, to learn to balance ourselves and to merge with life. We are taught how to go out and get things. We are taught how to go out and acquire things. We are told how to hold things, to preserve things. But we are never taught one of the most fundamental and important viewpoints, and that is how to flow with things how to let things move, how to learn to let things go. One of my very favorite teachings, in fact, probably the single most important entity in my life right now has become the Tao, written by a man by the name of Latsul. 
We don't know a lot about him, and it's really not important that we do. Great masters have no biography. They have no past. They live only in the now. I'd like to read to you from the beautiful teachings of the Tao to help us understand more how we may harmonize with life rather than seek to create opposition within our life. And please remember, where there is opposition in our life, there will always be suffering. You and I do not suffer because we harmonize with life, but because we oppose it. The Tao is a teaching of harmony and of flow, of life. And when we move with this flow in this life, something very beautiful happens. We regain something called spontaneity. Spontaneity, very important concept. Listen, this is number 70 in the Tao. I will read it to you and then I'd like to talk about it briefly. Latzul says, my words are easy to understand and easy to perform, yet no man under heaven knows them or practices them. My words have ancient beginnings. My actions are disciplined. Because men do not understand, they have no knowledge of me. Those that know me are very few. Those that abuse me are honored. Therefore, the sage wears rough clothing and holds the jewel in his heart. My words are easy to perform, is what Latsul says here. Easy to understand, and yet no one does it. You know one of the most difficult things that you and I will ever face? It is simplicity. We have allowed our mind to complicate our life so that we forget that the most beautiful part of us is to remain simple or to find simplicity again within our life. Simplicity is so important. To become simple again means that we are going to have to drop the mind. We're going to have to drop all of its illusions, its judgments, its false and pseudo needs. Simplicity. Let me give you an example of simplicity. Spend a few moments, if you can, just looking at things without judging them, without analyzing them, without thinking of them in terms of the past or the future. That is simplicity. To allow the mind to be nothing more than a placid mirror rather than a confused window which we look through the muck and the mire and the dust through to try to gain a perception and understanding. Latsul is right. This way of the Tao is understandable, but very few people do it because it requires simple simplicity again. The more we work in our mind, the more we struggle with concepts, the more we theorize, of course, the more we lose. We become complex again. Your meditation time is so very important. It's a time for you to remain simple, to go back to the simplicity of things like just breathing, and remembering who you are beyond your physical body and beyond your problems and your circumstances. Simplicity, it is the jewel of the heart. Latsul says that his work is a work of discipline. Do you know what discipline is? Many people misunderstand it. They think in terms of discipline as not doing those things which they, uh, they love to do, but that's not the truth. Discipline is not doing those things that hurt you. It hurts us every time we take on anger. It hurts us every time we take on fear. It hurts us every time we take on anything that would hurt us in a spiritual way, such as resentment and hostility. That is the simplicity that I speak of. We complicate our life whenever we take on anger and hostility and vengeance. That's why our life suffers the way it does. When Latsul talks about discipline, he's talking about not allowing the trivial things of life to take us away from the meaning and the purpose of our life. He's talking about, again, finding that utter simplicity in our soul. He ends with this very beautiful comment. Listen, those that know me are few. Those that abuse me are honored. Therefore, the sage wears rough clothing and holds the jewel in his heart. Every great master looks very common. Jesus looked like a common person. He didn't look like the saint that so many religions in the Western world want us to think that he looked like. 
In fact, do you remember what he said to us? Many are called, but few are chosen. To paraphrase that in our modern day vernacular would be to say, many are called, but few of us have chosen to follow the spiritual path. The spiritual path is a simple one. It's not filled with a lot of dogma and a lot of myth and a lot of philosophy. It is the jewel that lives in our heart. And the jewel is your heart. Don't be working so much from your mind, from your emotions. Spend time in clarity, clarity through meditation. Be the one that makes the choice to follow the inner path, not the outward path. It's easy to be religious, ladies and gentlemen. Anybody can be religious. All you have to do is follow the mandates of your mind. It's rigidity, it's anger, it's fear. All of religion is based on that. It's something quite different to work from our heart. There we will have to be supple. There we will have to live in kindness and compassion. There we will work out of our intuitive nature. To be simple again is to return to the flow of life. Life is not a mystery. It has nothing to do with mysteries. It has to do with simplicities. You won't get it through knowledge and you won't get it through intellect. You will get it from your heart. And when we remain simple in our heart and compassionate, clear and meditative, then life has the opportunity to flow back to us. This week, practice your meditation being clear where there is no object, no desire, no gain, no loss. Just the simple, compassionate clarity of our mind, seeing things as they are, without any form of rigidity, without any form of fear. As we begin to live a more simple life, we begin to see that the jewel is in our heart. Needless to say, with a show such as ours, we get some very interesting mail, and I could not resist but to answer the mail on TV. I try to answer every letter that comes to us personally, but I thought some of these were so interesting and really so fascinating that maybe some of you out there would learn something by them. It was certainly wonderful for us to receive the letters. Not all of them are kind, I want you to understand, and we have uh, tried to uh, include everything that we can. First question comes from a viewer in Bonita. I've been watching your program for six months. I'm really not quite sure who you are or who you're representing. Can you please tell me more about your philosophical background? One of the interesting things about the program is, and one of the interesting things about you, the viewer, is that you're expecting to have some sort of label put on any program such as this. When we made Aspire, we didn't make it to represent anything. I'm not here to represent anyone or anything. My have no philosophical background either. That's what's so confusing. When you try to take a truth and put a label on it, or you take a teaching that is ancient like the Tao, or Buddha's teachings, or Jesus' teachings, and you put the label on them, then you have institutionalized them and lost them. One of the basic reasons why many people miss Jesus today is because he's been institutionalized. Christianity has taken his teachings and instead of making them beautiful and seeking to show how they liberate us, basic Western religion of Christianity has taught it how, us how to take that beautiful teaching and make a dogma out of it, make a ritual out of it, actually imprison us. People these days are imprisoned by religion. I am not here to give you philosophy. You can get that anywhere. That's a rich man's toy. My object with you is simply to offer to you the truth that you know deep within yourself, a teaching, a pathway to find yourself. When you have found yourself, you will have found the Christ. You will have found God. You will have found Buddha. You will have found life. I'm not here to represent anyone. So if you're looking for that reason, if you're trying to label me, don't because I'm slippery. Sometimes I'll be over here teaching the Tao and sometimes I'll be teaching the way of the Christ that Jesus talked about. Sometimes I'll talk about Buddha. You can't label anything. Great masters teach us the way of eternal life. They don't teach us dogma and religion. No master was interested in religion. They were interested in our life and the way of it. Another question we got from El Cajon. I've been in truth slash metaphysics for many years and have enjoyed its positive message, but I find it very difficult to be positive all the time. 
In fact, it has become a strain in my life to always be so positive. Is there any hope for someone like me? No. It is not to be positive. Metaphysics, truth, this work is not a positive thinking type of organization, not a positive thinking work. We are not here to teach you how to be positive. We are not here to teach you what to get, how to get it. You can't remain positive all the time. It's impossible. If you are only positive, you deny the negative. And if there were no negative, there would be no positive. It would be like saying, I'm only going to look at the positive ions, not the negative ions of life. I'm only going to look in the morning. I'm not going to look in the evening. You can't deny the negative. It's not bad. We have treated negative things as though they are bad, and they are really not. Negative is a word that we have given to anything that we don't understand. Anything that we don't like, anything that seems to cause us pain or suffering is a resistance of our own mind. Our mind creates the illusion of negativity. Our mind creates the illusion of fear, and therefore we call things bad. There is nothing that is bad. Seek not to look at anything that appears to be negative and look at it as though it is bad. Look at it for what it is. Seek to understand it. Pain is caused in our life because our mind resists the nature of all things. It's another way in which we are in opposition to life. Jesus never said that anything was negative. When Lazarus was dead, he didn't call that a bad situation. He didn't even call his own crucifixion a negative situation. If you will notice, the Master only talked in terms of understanding why things happen the way they do. So our dear friend in El Cajon, please don't try to be positive. It is not necessary to be positive. What is necessary is to see all things just as they are. Don't let your mind create the illusion that this is good and this is bad and this is positive and this is negative. There is no such thing. When we do that, we create resistance in us and we make it virtually impossible to do the one thing that is so necessary in our life, and that is to understand. We had another question, and this one came from San Diego. What is the purpose for religion? Does it really have to be, does it really have a place, excuse me, in our society? I'm beginning not to be able to tell religion from politics anymore. Good question. I can't either. I think there are many ministers who are nothing more than frustrated politicians. I don't think that they're there to teach the work. I think they're there to make a name for themselves. They go into politics. They go into places that have nothing to do with the teachings. If you will notice, Jesus never talked about politics. He never dealt with the politics of his day. He never dealt with the Roman Empire and their oppression over the Jewish people. I wonder how we would react in those situations. Religion serves one function in our society. It justifies our evil. It justifies our ignorance. We have taken religion and we've created it as a prison within our life and then we find reasons to kill, we find reasons to condemn, we find reasons to hurt people. We call this religion. We call it morality, we call it right, or we call it wrong. There is no need for religion. There is need for meditation. There is need for silence. There is need for spirituality. But religion, we've made a mockery out of it. None of us really understand the difference anymore between religion and politics. They've mingled so completely and so intricately that we've missed the purpose of inspiration. I'd like you to think about this for a moment. The individual who has a sense of their own spirituality would have no use for politics, would have no use for a religion that told him what he could do and what he couldn't do. Religion in our country serves only the function of being a conscience for us. We don't need conscience. We need consciousness, a deep awareness of why things are the way they are and how they evolve. Don't be looking to me or to this program ever for religion. You'll never get it. Jesus never gave us religion. Buddha never gave us religion. Lao Tzu never gave us religion. Mohammed, Socrates, they were not religious people. They were rebellious. They were rebels and they taught us the way of our own spirituality. It is deeply important that we understand that. One last question. 
I hear you speak about spiritual transformation. What is it, and is it really possible? Transformation spiritually is very simple to describe, it is a whole renewal of self. Spiritual transformation doesn't happen because you take on a new thought or you come to my center or to any metaphysical or truth center or religious church. It doesn't matter. Transformation is when you are changed, when you are, so to speak, born again as the Master tried to teach us. And that born again attitude doesn't come because a minister waves his hand over your head and says that you are or he dunks you in water. Transformation comes when it's more important for us to love than it is to hate. Transformation comes when it's more important for us to understand the nature of how all things rise and fall in life, rather than to condemn things and berate things, misunderstand things, label people as good and bad, right and wrong. Transformation is a simple process. It's when we go back to the simplicity of our heart and not the egotism of our mind. It is impossible through religion to ever find spiritual transformation. Religion is concerned with your behavior, your actions, not your consciousness. They're interested in keeping you where you are, not in setting you free. Transformation is a point of being set free. To practice the concepts of unconditional love, not in action, but out of consciousness. We miss a lot of that in our life. We try to live our life purely from our body and our actions, rather than from our being. When you and I live from our being more than we live from the conditioning of our thoughts, of our past, and our fear of the future, that's when spiritual transformation will happen. And as far as is it possible, <laughs> that's up to you. How dedicated are you to it? For some people it is very possible, for others it is yet to happen. You know, if you sit and take some time to meditate here at the ocean, you begin to feel the rhythm and the harmony of life. It's quite beautiful, isn't it? So much of our life has been spent in total resistance to what is. We're always trying to manipulate and get what we want, what we think we should have, what others think we should have, that we've missed the whole purpose of our life. In many ways, that's what religion has been all about, how to miss our life, how not to understand the beauty or the value of it. We are so busy building religious beliefs and wants and ideals that we forget that life is just continuing as an eternal and loving process all the time. Learning to surrender to the essence of life is the most important thing that any of us can do. We're down here on this beautiful beach taking some time to enjoy the beauty and the non-resistance of nature. And nature is non-resistant. It moves with the flow of itself. And this week, if you do anything, I hope that you do move with the flow of yourself because in that flow is power and abundance, happiness, peace and serenity. The Tao is all about life, dear friend, and the surrender to it. We want to remind you that life is not supposed to be a painful experience. It is only our resistance to life and our ignorance of it that makes it painful. I want to thank you for being with us in this edition. We'll see you next week on Aspire. We understand the closer that we get, we'll find it who we are. We choose between the left and right, the ups and downs, the darkness all. So many